I want to welcome you guys out this morning. My name is Pastor Omar. For those who don't know, I'm an associate pastor here at Victory, where our mission is to save, to serve, to send. It is New Year's Eve, guys. I'll tell you, December has fought me good. I've had five different colds this month. And every time I go to speak, it hits me again. But that doesn't stop me. I give everything to the power of God. The glory of God moves. And we all enjoy his presence. I want to thank you guys for coming out this morning. I want to tell you this. It is beautiful to see this place packed out. New Year's Eve, we don't stay home. We come in, we praise the Lord. So new year, new you, right? Right? Um, how's the, how's the, the New Year's Eve or the New Year's uh, resolution challenges going? We got a lot of those? Oh, I'm going to... You might not like me after the service. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying they're, they're bad, okay? I'm saying it's good. It's good for change. It's good to want to better yourself, for sure. But I want to challenge the idea this morning of chasing the new. In fact, I have, I have spoke on this idea as I studied through it through actually different times that I've spoken, whether it was through announcements or whatever, and I just did a deeper dive into it. And I actually want to teach through this one. But before I do, I want to share a story about new and about understanding kind of original roots. I want you to picture this. Hundreds of years ago, Virginia's rolling hills, okay? We have Thomas Jefferson, a man that had dreams and ambition, a man that was able to help shape this country. Good, bad, that's your opinion. But we're stepping into Monticello, right? And this is, this is Thomas Jefferson's vineyard heaven. This is his dream. So pastor's going to end the year speaking on wine. He is in fact a dreamer. He had his eyes set on this, these fields and, he, and turning them into America's answer to Europe's finest wine. He wanted to compete. He wanted to produce and he wanted to bring back to America. But dreams are, they're tricky things and his didn't quite ripen. They didn't pan out the way he wanted them and those vineyards didn't come to pass the way he wanted them on his time on earth. But when I tell you that he spent a lot of time in research, he spent a lot of time in that dream to see what it would do and do it right, I would be, that would be an understatement. Now, if you fast forward a few centuries, the winemaking scene starts buzzing in this country, especially in Virginia. And then here comes what ends up becoming known as the father of Virginia wine is Gabrielle Ross. This was a time when everyone was chasing the new, okay? Even much like today, everybody was chasing the new, the untested, the, the planting strange seeds and grapes, hoping to bottle something extraordinary. But sometimes kind of in the rush for the new, you miss the mark. See, Ross, though, he, he was cut from a different cloth. He, he, as he was pursuing it, and he was actually starting to follow the trends of what everyone else was trying to do, the next best new thing, he stopped and he took a, a step back. He actually started doing his research into the history and he started flipping through the pages of Thomas Jefferson. <clears throat> he started going back to what was the original intention? What was the original design? 
And here's a man who respects the old tales, who knows that there's wisdom in those roots. See, Ross decides to march down Jefferson's path, betting on the same European grapes and everything that you're talking about hundreds of years before. And what unfolds is honestly pure alchemy. Those vines, they took to the Virginia soil like warriors in a battlefield. They claimed their land. The grapes under the watch of that sun, they didn't just grow, they, they thrived. And the wine, it was, it was this victorious battle cry in a bottle, okay? He did what Thomas Jefferson wanted to do. Monticello's vineyard started churning out wine that made the world sit up and take notice. Ross, he didn't just make good wine. He woke up uh, a dream, a research. He woke up an original intention that was centuries in slumber. This tale from Monticello, it, it teaches us a, a solid lesson that the new isn't always in uncharted waters or trend setting. It isn't from patching things together and always trying to be innovative in hybrid creations. I'm not knocking them, but see, Ross could have done what we do most of the time. He could have consistently chased the new. But most of the time, the new wasn't designed the way the original plan was. Instead of chasing something new, instead of doing something that he would have just took all the credit for himself, he focused on renewing what was already designed before him. Which leads me to the story in the Bible about Jesus. Why not let's end this year hearing the words of Jesus himself? So I'm gonna speak on the new wine. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak on three verses, all back to back, Luke 5, 36 through 39. All you new folks are gonna be like, oh, this is gonna be a nice short service. Y'all don't know me with three verses. <laughs> Luke 5, 36 through 39. <clears throat> He told them this parable. No one, tear, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the, the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. Let me tell you, I've read this parable so many times. And it's confusing when you really read it. When you just skim past it and you go through it real quick and you just read it, take it for for surface value, yeah, you can, you can get something from it, but there is so much that is spoken to in such a simple parable. The story seems simple, but then it, it even kind of ends confusing because it's, it's speaking about new wine and you need new wineskins. But then it says, and no one after drinking old wine wants the new for they say the old is better but you're not supposed to pour new wine in old wineskin. So it, it gets a little confusing. Is it, is it new? Is it, is it old? What was Jesus trying to tell us here? But there's honestly so much that goes into this. I'm just gonna break it down into three sections or each, each verse is two sentences. And I'm gonna start off with the first one that says, no tears, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Matter of fact, I believe it's a little bit longer. I didn't have it here when we go back to the verse. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. 
Many times we are unpleased with ourselves. This can be physical, it can be mental, it can be spiritual. This can be from past decisions you've done or done to you. This can be from being unhappy with your body or how far you got in life or the lack of. It could be endless. It could feel unique and different to you. But what is common is that when we are unhappy with ourselves, we don't want to identify with that part of ourselves anymore. I think this is why New Year's resolutions are so popular. Especially if we feel unsuccessful previously in that area. So we go and we see what we feel we should look like or feel like or act like and we want something new. We flirt with the abandonment of our old self and are in search of a new self. Why is that bad? I mean, the Bible tells us that we're called to be new, right? We have to understand what that means though. Because as we start tearing off pieces of ourselves and we start tearing off pieces of the outside things that we like, our surroundings are the ideas of what we want ourselves to look like. We, we use them and we start patching ourselves up. The problem is, just like the verse says, it, it doesn't match. So then we... Then one change, it isn't enough. Now we need another new piece and another new piece and another new piece. And this didn't satisfy me. Might have tickled me a little bit, but it didn't take me where I needed it to be. I need to rip something else off and add it to myself. And eventually, we don't look like how we used to. We don't feel like how we used to. and We don't act like how we used to, but we also aren't satisfied with it either. We can trick ourselves into thinking that this is progression, but in fact, it's deterioration. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. I want you to think about this concept. <clears throat> Probably going to be drinking a whole lot of water. That wasn't the concept. I want you to think about this concept with plastic surgery. Okay? I'm not knocking people that have done things. Hear me out. Most people start with small and simple, but they end up unrecognizable, even if you look good in the end. Most people will only start with, and they, they will convince themselves, it's just the little thing I'm going to do. I'm just going to change this little thing. I'm just going to patch this little thing. But it didn't satisfy them enough. So they keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And eventually, they don't look like how they originally looked. They become addicted to tearing off new garments to patch their old self. I'll just, I'll just do a little bit here and... I'll just do a little bit here and I'll just do a little bit here and I'll just do a little bit. <laughs> when we think we are on this journey of transformation, we're actually on a journey of mutilation. We are destroying an original design that was just not managed well. We will no longer match what we were supposed to look like because we were unsatisfied with what we currently look like. Used up wineskins. Why if we treat our material things with great upkeep trying to preserve its original design, do we treat ourselves as mix and match, piece together piles of junk? Think about it. An original Michael Jordan 
basketball card carries no value being pieced together with any of his other newer cards. Any cards at all. You cut that card and you add something to it, you lost its value. Classic cars will carry no value if you just bunch a bunch of different cars together, part them off, solder them, cut them up, put them, weld them, do whatever you got to do. Different door, different back, different front. You could try to make it look good. You can call it custom. You might be able to get somebody to buy it. But that doesn't mean it carries the original classic value. So you didn't catch that. You might be able to convince yourself enough to sell others on the change. That you can sell it off in the private market. But you can never take that to a specialist or a collector and retain any respect of value. So as you try to chase the new patches, you might sell people on it, but that doesn't mean that you're not selling out on your own originality and authenticity of God's design for you. The Bible never talks about redesigning. It always talks about restoration. But we, we will see that coming ahead. Jumping into the next scriptures, it says that no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. This example is much like when we want those new positions and the new things in life, but we aren't prepared to be able to handle the weight of new. A lot of times we're not prepared to handle it, not because we weren't strong throughout our life, but because our life has been daunting and held us down and tore us up to the point that we are old wineskins trying to carry on the new. We have not prepared ourselves for what God is already trying to put forward. That position might be yours, but you weren't prepped for it. I'm not saying in my last point that new things are bad. Hear what I'm saying. I'm saying in my last point that becoming a new thing isn't what you might think it is. We chase the new fads and the new trends and the new diets and the new business ideas and the New Year's resolutions and all these things, right? We get so excited to chase the new because honestly, honestly, we're so unsatisfied with the old. I can guarantee you that the majority in this room, if given the chance to be completely different, they would sell their old self for the new. But since we can't, honestly, since we can't, we chase the new in hopes to not only patch pieces of us, but also of our surroundings. <clears throat> can I be honest today? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you, bro. It doesn't bother me. This is the... This is why the idea of picking up and moving has always been on your mind. And I say that confidently because I know that everyone in here at one point or another, if not right now, flirts with that very thing. I did. I do. I still do sometimes. A new start, a new job, a new school, a new house, a new neighborhood, new friends, a new church. But when we are not called to do so or been prepared to do so, it's like pouring new wine in old wineskin. Things will fall apart and you will continue this journey of establishing new. You will continue patching it and patching it and patching it. And your entire life, when you look back, has just been a series of patches. So much that you may have abandoned the thing that God had for you in the chase of the thing that the enemy put in front of you. Listen, it's... it's it's so much easier. I want you guys to understand, 
It's, it's, it's a very common struggle, but it's so much easier to abandon an old building and find new ground to build on than to rebuild what was originally there. See, rebuilding, it takes a lot. You can't just build on what's currently there. There are some deconstruction of improper structures that need to be cleared out. There's some cleanup involved. There's planning a lot, a, a lot more uh, work that goes in. Because again, no one pours new wine into old wineskins because the new wine will burst the skins. I know I'm about to sound like I'm contradicting myself for now, but you can't pour new wine into the old wineskins. You know the reason that those things, you know the reason that those things you have been chasing haven't been working out fully the way you wanted them to? You may be too busy trying to pour a new life into your old mindset. You may, you may be too busy trying to grab the new things but still be in your old ways. You can't receive the new things in life built on your old ways. But pastor, you just said I shouldn't abandon my old self. No, I didn't say that. You shouldn't chase what isn't you. The only way to know who you are, though, is to know who God is. And I think this is why Jesus teaches in parables because he's consistently trying to tell you the ways to find out who you are. We love riddles. We don't like to apply them. But this is what Jesus is consistently trying to teach us. You can't know who you are until you know who God is. And then learn from God who we were Supposed to be. Original design. Our original intention. I think what's confusing is that a lot of times we think that we go through all these things in life because that's what God intended for us. That wasn't our original design. That wasn't our original intention. I'm sorry to burst anybody's theology, but we weren't supposed to live through sin. But many times, we want to tell God who we are. Mm, got quiet in that one. Can we cut the crap? Come on, man. The end of the year, coming into the new year, let's cut the crap. Let's cut the fat off of this. We rather spend our time telling God who we want to be instead of trying to learn who God designed us originally to be. That's all we do. We don't realize we do it. I caught myself doing it. I'm not above it. We're human. You have no idea how many times I've seen people that are highly capable of immense things far beyond me, way more talented, way more skilled, but they cave or they collapse or they conform to something else because even though God said, I got this for you, they respond with, okay, but what about that? What if I also add this to it? What, what, if, what if I get to that when I can get to that, but I got this going right now? What if I did it my way? We see it in the Bible. What if I don't want to wait? Abraham? Enough said? Pure promise of God? Miracle to happen? Didn't want to wait? Took it into his own hands? And we don't realize, but the pouring of new wine into old wineskins is legit us playing God over our life. That's scary. That is so scary, but it doesn't feel scary when we're doing it. You know what it is? 
We call it self-control. We call it self-management because we're too afraid to let go. Let me make sense with all of this. And I do this with the last verse, <clears throat> which is confusing until we define the context. It says, no, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say the old is better. Before I bring the original context to this verse, I want you to understand that when referring to old, they refer to aged. I mean, obviously anybody that's ever thought about wine understands the concept of aged grapes, fermentation and stuff. Not so I need to go drink, okay? And the aged of its original design actually carries a value beyond anything a new grape can provide. Much like Thomas Jefferson's design, there's more to the new than what the new presents to you. And when Jesus is speaking on the new here, he's actually speaking on two different types of new. Again, I say this a lot. The English language jacks things up. We can make it make sense understanding how the old here still has its place versus the focus on chasing the new designs. We have to stop, hear me church, we have to stop chasing the new us and start allowing God to renew us. Amen? Amen? Jesus is literally, he's using this parable to illustrate many things. I could, I could honestly preach multiple messages out of these three verses, okay? Or, or yeah, these three scriptures. But one, I believe, is how God didn't miscreate us. How God didn't mess up in the beginning. How he didn't fail when it came to you. I want you to grab this concept real quick. For God to have to make us brand new would be for God to contradict his own original intention and design. And I don't believe that in a God that has never failed. Let's get our teach on. In, in the original Greek text of the New Testament, two different words are used for new. In this context, it's new and kinews. Let's explore the usage in this parable. Luke 50, uh, 5, 37, 38. And no one pours new, neos, wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new neos wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. Sound like I'm going through puberty. Finally. No. New, new, neos, wine must be poured into new, kineos, wineskins. So we miss that in English. So let's understand the difference between the two. Neos, the Greek word typically refers to something that is new in time. It is bought brand new. It is created there on the spot. It implies a new kind of something that it, it, it exists. You can, it can have its place, but in the parable, Neos describes the wine as being freshly made. It's, it's new. It's not previously existing. Kineos, this word suggests something new in nature, in quality or form. It implies it's not brand new, but renewed. In this context, Kineos wineskins will not simply be new, brand new skins, but skins of a renewed kind, better suited for the new wine. So let's read that again. And no one pours new, brand new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new, brand new wine will burst the skins, and the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new, brand new wine must be poured into new, renewed wineskins. The idea here is that God doesn't want to make us brand new. 
Okay? He didn't fail at you. He wants to bring us to our original new states. He wants to bring us back to when he was creating the stars in the heavens and he was calling us out and knitting us up. He wants to bring us to where before sin covered the earth. He wants us to bring to our original design and our original purpose. He doesn't need to redesign you. He wants to reestablish you. He, he wants to take what he already made perfect and what the, the world manipulated and, and stepped on and trampled and trashed. He wants to bring it back to its original value. Are you hearing me, church? God didn't screw up on you. Your school might have, okay? Your parents might have. Forgive them. You might have, but God didn't. God never did. And you will not be able to experience the original beauty in God's design of you until you let God renew you. Let me tell you this. Feeling complete will only come from the ability to let go of what you think you are and letting God take you to a place of restoration and redemption. I've seen this illustration, okay? It's of a $100 bill. I'm going to take it a step further, but... Right? I've seen this illustration of a $100 bill. And I ask you, how much is this worth? It's worth 100 bucks, right? What if I crumple it up? Still 100 bucks, right? But what, what, what if I step on it? And step on it. Step on it. I feel like that was Pastor Larry's dance right there. doesn't. It's, it's still a hundred bucks. The trials this bill has been through doesn't take away its original value as long as it's kept in what? Its original design. I can make this bill, you know, with enough time, I can make it look how it used to, and I'm not God. Right? Y'all with me? But I'm going to take it a little further. I heard a yep in the back. <laughs> what if I cut it? What if I cut this? What if I, what if I didn't see the value? What if I missed those O's? What if I, what if I felt like maybe I needed to be at a five or a 20 to it? Like I grabbed some tape here. Let's, let's try to make this work. I'm going to, I'm going to piece together this. This is how some of us treat our lives. I'll tell you this. I just taped it to the table. What if I cut these 20 and this five and how much is this bill worth now? It's not worth anything. Nobody wants it. I mean, you may trick someone into thinking it has multiple other values. 
But the truth is, it only needed to be renewed, not made into something brand new. It didn't need to be reinvented. Not given a different dividend. Just an understanding and a process of the original design and allowing it for restoration. God wants to bring you back to your original intention, to your original design, your original uh, uh, value. Going into this new year, we need to stop chasing the new us and start truly letting God renew us. No matter how old or young in the faith or on the planet, no matter how unsatisfied we are with ourselves and our past, we aren't called to forget our unique and beautiful original design. We aren't called to burn off our fingerprints in hopes of a new identity, okay? We aren't called to sacrifice our genders in hope to fall in love with ourselves. all right? We're not called to hate where we are at, but to fall in love with what God originally wanted us to be. It's not transition, it's transformation. It's not abandonment, it's establishment. It's not about retrofitting, it's about restoration. And it's not about becoming new, it's allowing the original creator, the original designer of heaven and earth, of the stars and the skies, of the the animals and the plants and the birds and the beauty around us, bring us back to our original state. Through his blood, through his sacrifice, and through his love for us. You're not a bad design. In fact, the fact that you don't look like the person next to you, unless you're a twin, shows how uniquely valued you are. You are one of one. In a collector's market, that's top dollar. You were designed perfectly for what God wanted. You've allowed your life to skew your vision and to not recognize the things through godly eyes, but through worldly eyes. You just allowed everything around you for years make you hate you so that you want to create a new you instead of truly giving God all of you. I close with this. And I got time on the clock. Maybe I don't close with this. <clears throat> oh, they told me I close with this. Don't get caught in the new. Get caught in the renew. There's a difference between chasing the new guys and experiencing a renew. I'm not saying God doesn't have new experiences in life and new developments and new opportunities and new businesses and new things. I'm not saying that. I'm saying stop doing that on the old wineskins. Do it on the renewed wineskin. A renew looks brand new. Can I tell you that? Renew is the concept from Saul to Paul, okay? From Jacob to Israel, from Simon to Peter. We see new, but God wasn't giving them new. He was restoring them to their original design. When we chase new, the mere utter fact is we aren't chasing God. That's not saying God doesn't give us the new things, like I said. But God can't trust us to hold the weight of new things if we haven't been renewed to carry it. It says seek the kingdom first, right? Not the new. Abraham was promised a new child, like I said earlier, but instead of focusing on the kingdom, he chased the idea of new. David was seeing something a little new in the window and he destroyed a marriage and ended a life because of it. While Moses was in the presence of God, the Israelites were creating a new God to worship. 
The Israelites at another time, at one point, was governed by God while everyone else had the king. They had the best king. They had the king of kings. But they wanted a human one instead. And we know how that panned out. How about how God rejected King Saul through the process? Do you, do you really remember? There's a couple things here, but King Saul, let me tell you this, waiting for the prophet of Samuel to offer a sacrifice to God before a battle, he grew impatient. Saul took matters into his own hands. Mind you, King Saul was a play, person of, of, of position took matters into his own hands and offered the sacrifice himself, a role not designated for him. His disobedience and pursuit of a new way rather than waiting for Samuel led to God rejecting him as king. We cause more damage when we are distracted by the new and it's not just us who we damage, we damage those around us when we're distracted by the new and chase them instead of being faithful to what God is giving us and allowing God to be the provider. God doesn't destroy our design. He makes us better. And what looks like something entirely different to us through our transformations looks very familiar to what God originally wanted. He recognizes us even more. Don't get the new mixed up with the renew. New things might be good, but being renewed is God. Yeah. It's time to stop hating your old, okay? And allowing God to take you back to what he had for you. You were designed with purpose. You were designed with intentions. You were designed with beauty. Every single one of us. You don't need new. You need now. This new year, don't chase the new you. Let God truly renew you. I'd like you to bow your head and close your eyes. <clears throat> Good friend of mine, one, one of my favorite people to talk to, actually. I don't get enough time to talk to him. I'm going to change that. That's my New Year's resolution. I've watched him change his life over the past couple years. Like actually get it done. And I know he has a heart for God. He just posted a quote. It says, you don't need another resolution. You need discipline. The first part of discipline starts with surrendering. Surrendering your old mindsets, surrendering your old ways. If you are unsatisfied with the outcome, why are you continuing with what isn't working? It's time to give it to God. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, I just want to give you a moment. If you do not know Christ, you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He is not the person that you've surrendered everything to. You have not given it all to God. I just want you to raise your hand. If now is the moment, if God is speaking to you, I just want you to take this moment, take this opportunity. Don't wait for the new year, for the new you. Do it now. Give your life to Christ. It's that easy. Or maybe... Maybe, maybe you've known Christ for a long time, but you hate yourself. And I'll tell you this, and I say this with love, and God's talking to you right now in your heart, so hear me out. But if you hate yourself, then you're not spending time with God. A relationship with God does not produce that hate. It produces love. So stop lying to yourself. Stop lying to others. Stop trying to, I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm trying to tell you what I've done for many years. And now is the time. And if you just want to surrender everything to God, 
You just want to rekindle that relationship with God. You want to go into this new year being renewed that the end of this next year is not going to look like this year. I want you to raise your hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I'm talking to you, church. Sometimes you're so churched. Sometimes you're so in the habit of coming to church that you haven't even started the renew process. You have to show up and show out. And I don't mean that in a harsh way. I'm telling you, this was the majority of my walk. I might knew who God was, but I didn't know God personally. I might have had personal moments with God, but I didn't give him my all. And today we changed that. So I'm going to do one last call. If that's you, raise your hand. I see that hand. Listen, whether you raise your hand or you didn't, if that's you, I want you to come to the front. Please, I want to pray with you. This is the best possible gift that I get to experience. It's not a gift to me. It's one I get to experience. It's a gift to God that you're allowing him to bring you back to where you were supposed to be. It's not your fault. Remember this. It'd be your fault to stay there. Come to the front. Come. I want to talk to you guys. Just give me a second. We perish from a lack of knowledge. And a lot of times we don't, we look at ourselves in the mirror and in our life and in our experience and we say, there's no way to bring this to new. I've tried it before, it doesn't happen. But I'll be honest with you. It's because we're thinking that we're gonna be brand new. That's abandoning the design that God had for you. He designed you to look and be a certain way, to be unique, not to look like anybody else to embrace your uniqueness, your creativity, your mindsets that he had for you. He already calls you beautiful. He already calls you sons and daughters. We've allowed not only the world to lie to us, so much we believe it and we actually will speak it more than anybody else. So today, it's not a New Year's resolution. It's a surrender to allowing God to truly have all of us so that we surrender, we give it to God, and he transforms us. It's a process. But I tell you, it's a beautiful one. I was just thinking about Years ago, before I met my wife, and even when I met my wife, how different I was. Never in a million years. I would have bet all the money in the world that I would have never, never gotten to this place. Does that mean I'm perfect? No. I still get mad at times. I still screw up. But let me tell you something. I have been renewed by Christ and Christ alone. And God has it for you. He doesn't abandon the old wineskins. He renews you and restores you. So I want you guys to pray with me. But believe what you're praying. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe. Church, you can repeat it too. I believe that you died for my sins, for my life, to bring me back to you. Personally, you had me in mind so that you could defeat death, so death wouldn't defeat me. You rose again, 
and you ascended to heaven with victory. I repent especially of the mindsets is this is who I was designed to be. I open my mind and my heart to who you've created me to be. And I declare today that I am excited to find out who that is. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to pray for you guys. Father God, right now, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. Thank you so much for every individual here. I thank you for my brother. I just declare that you have called him to be exactly what you've designed him and not anything else. Lord, I thank you for his uniqueness and his creativity. And I just declare that he embraces it. He is a fingerprint, unlike any other fingerprint. And I declare that you use him how you've called him to be used. But first, let him fall in love with spending time with you. A renewed process of being with you. Allow him to be redeveloped back into the original state that you have called him to be. I declare over your life, Father God, right now over his life, that you show him, that you give him visions of what it is that you've called him. And that even though he could feel like there's lost time, that you are the one who controls time. That you renew time. That you bring it back. We don't need new years for new use. We need you and only you. And I declare that over his life and his heart right now. Anything that the devil has stole from him, I declare you're going to give it back to him many times over, Father God, right now. But all I declare in, in the midst of this next season and this year is that he spends time with you, that he surrenders it all to you, and that next year is going to look different than this year. I declare he is not done. He is just starting. I declare right now, Father God, whoo! I declare right now, Father God, you got so much ready for him. So much stored new wine but I declare a full surrender, a full surrender, a full surrender, a full surrender in the name of Jesus. I declare, I declare that, you, that you're not gonna recognize yourself, but God is gonna see you exactly how he had called you to be. So much for you right now in the name of Jesus. So much right now in the name of Jesus. I speak over your life right now. Let me tell you, those trials were not for nothing, but God is going to utilize them for other people. Those testimonies are going to be for other people. But what God wants is not just for the other people. God wants you. Let me tell you, and I want the whole church to hear this. God can use you, but God wants you. God can use you, but he wants you. Okay? He left the 99 for you. That means that the most important thing he can get from you is you. His will is your presence in his presence. Oh, he will use you. Oh, will he use you? He will use you to carry heavy weights. But let me tell you, ultimately, he designed you to be with him. Take that. Spend time with him, surrender it to him, and allow him to make you who he has called you to be. And Father God, I speak over, I speak over these women, and I just tell you this, those lies over their life, oof, they, are not, they are not true. They are not true. They do not need to to conform to anything but you and your word. <clears throat> they were set apart. They were designed perfectly. They were children, but most important, precious princess daughters of royalty. And you've given them such a purpose, not to sit down and stay quiet, but to be used for the kingdom to be used to nurture, to be used to establish, but ultimately, again, to be in your presence. I declare that when they look at themselves, they see the beautiful masterpiece you've created them to be. 
I declare you remove the veils from their eyes and allow their spiritual eyes to be open and be able to see you like never before. And when they see themselves, they see you through them. I thank you for their lives. In the name of Jesus. God sees you. Let me tell you, God sees you. You're not lost. You're not forgotten. You never were. God sees you. (laughs) He loves you. Never less. God sees you, he's not disappointed. God is in love. But he wants you to know what it is to be loved, what it is to experience true, authentic love. It's going to be, I'm not trying to just say this, but this is going to be a really a really transformative year for you if you really, if you believe that you deserve it. Because God says you are worthy. God calls you righteous. The only thing you need is faith. Do you hear me? You have been highlighted. You have been set apart. And God sees you. We thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing, and we just declare these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We got a group of people. Follow them. Go out that door. Great people. Follow them. They want to talk to you. Do not miss that moment. Oh, man. Congregation, you may know God, but you still may not truly know yourself. That doesn't mean you haven't given your life to Christ. It doesn't mean you don't pray or spend time with God. All it means is you have yet to surrender yourself fully. I want you, if you want to truly surrender to God this year. If you've had enough, I just want you to stand up. You don't have to come to the front. Just stand up. Do you believe this is the year that you will not allow to look like any other year? Not a New Year's resolution. Not a fad. Not, not, not a, a trend. Not a promise. I just want you to stand to your feet. If I was sitting down, I'd stand up. And I want us to pray. Because we overcomplicate things, man. But enough is enough. We're going to open our hands. This is an act of, of surrendering. It's an act of giving it to God. We're going to thank God for everything. And we're going to open the door for God to have full access, full authority in our life to do what he wants us to do. Father God, right now, Lord, I thank you. I come in to your presence. I come into your throne room because you leave that door open for us willingly as your child, as a bearer of the inheritance that you set forward for me. And I'm going to stand on your word. And I'm going to declare that I don't need to know who I was and I don't need to know who I am. I need to know who you've called me to be. And I declare that this season, that this year, that that transformative process will come to pass. I declare that you will have your ways in the areas that I did not want to let go. And I declare it's yours. I come to this altar, I give it as an offering, and I give you all of me. Burn off whatever it is that's not me. 
and allow myself to look exactly how you've designed me to be and ultimately to love myself the way you love me. I declare more than anything in the world that we fall in love with you, the creator, the author, everything. We don't allow our past, our present, or our future to tell us differently. I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And everybody says, yeah. amen. All right. You guys may take your seat. I got... <coughs> I'm going to take a big nap today. We are ending this year. Okay? And I, I get, honestly, the privilege to be able to speak about, again, the legacy that I'm, I'm so honored to be a part of. I am not a part of a team. I am part of a legacy that has been years in the making, that has already traveled the world. In fact, if I really grasp the concept of the legacy that I'm a part of, I'm already in different countries right now as I speak because I'm intertwined. I am combined. I'm part of and consumed with the legacy of this church. I didn't do the footwork. I wasn't a missionary in Fiji or Guam for my pastors. I didn't go to Africa and establish a new church or Germany, but my pastor did. And I did things for him as he was doing those things and for the church and for God. And that just, you know what that did? That proved to me that I am not the body I am part of the body. And together, we move forward. So when I look into these offerings, especially the legacy offerings, I, I look at them as a blessing. I look at them as an opportunity to honestly sow myself deeper into that legacy. Because I know my time will come up. I know there will be a day that I will be with the Lord but I will tell you this, I have seeds that may go and I'm declaring life and that they're going to move nations, but even more, that they're even deeper in this legacy than I am. That they're going to take the visions and stand on my shoulders while I'm standing on the shoulders of my pastor. Let me tell you, Pastor Larry and Linda have done so much in their life to get people to God to plant those seeds. And this legacy offering, it's not, it's not just an opportunity to give a couple bucks. It's truly to sow yourself in a manner where you enter the ability to be across the world. I want to give an opportunity. I know some people haven't been from, from traveling, um, but we do have uh, the, the legacy brochures. If you haven't got one and you want one, just raise your hand and then the usher will give it to you. There's cards on it. I do know with the holiday seasons, there are times where it does get hard to give, but sometimes we got to stand in faith. But this isn't a one-time thing. We have a goal. We prayed about it. We came to it. It's 250000 Sound like a scary number to bring up and ask. One of the things I fell in love with this church when I first started coming, and this is a very shallow part of me, and I don't care, I'll say it, was when I first started coming to this church eight years ago, they barely talked about offering. My last church, it was a whole service before the service. I ain't knocking them, I'm just saying. When I came here and they were done, I was like, wait, was that not the offering? The service is done? Okay. I will tell you this, the second is that the books are open and I get to see where the church goes and what it does. But those are fleshly things. The biggest thing I get to experience is the transformation, the renewing, and then also being a part of that and watching others transform and be renewed. And not only that, it doesn't stay in my city, it goes across the world.
I want to put up a picture because we're not going to wait for the 250 for us to sow into these initiatives. There should be a picture, not, not of the initiatives. We'll go over the initiatives in a second. But there should be a picture from the Lehigh Community Services. And if it doesn't get there, <clears throat> that's fine. This community, this company, they help the needy with food and transportation. Why reinvent the wheel and try to fix things ourselves? Why not sow into our community through an organization that's already doing it well? So we did. I don't know if the picture's working or not, but we went, we already cut them a check. We stood with them boldly. And it wasn't, we didn't take a picture to boast on ourselves. We took a picture to show the congregation that we are moving forward, period. We're going to do this regardless. We're just extending the opportunity for everyone that calls this place home to be a part of it. Our legacy as of today is $81,652. And I'm proud of that. We are, we are about a third way in. We got bold names on that wall that you get to sign with a white pen. You don't have to wait to give to sign you. If you're giving your card and you're pledging for it, go sign that wall in faith. But we are a body we are individual moving parts. We need to do this. We're 81,652. Only 36% of our victory home people have jumped on board. And I'm not doing that to bash. I'm saying that 250 is 100% reachable. If everyone got on board, it would not we would, we would double. We'd honestly double. But pastor has said it before. If everyone only gave 495 bucks, we had, we'd meet the goal with no problem. We've had some people really go above and beyond. We really, really have. I don't say this for condemnation. I say this for encouragement. We get the privilege to do this. And we are going to move the kingdom forward locally and globally on this initiative. This isn't so we can do fancy things for ourselves and drive nice cars. This doesn't touch anyone's salary. This is to establish the kingdom on earth. I will tell you this. I know this is a bold Bold ask, but I'm going to pray before we give. If you give on the app, if you give on the website, there is a drop down menu. You can put for legacy offering. This isn't your, your, your offering and your tithes, but I'm going to put it on this $81,652.60. I think we can hit 100000 I think we can do it, but it's going to take a bold you. It's going to take one who really is going to put their word on God. I mean, there are some business owners, there are different things, but I'm not, I'm not going to put it on the top dogs either. I'm putting it on all of us because you want God to bless us and trust us. Let us be faithful with the little so he can make us rulers over much. I'm going to pray for this legacy offering right now. Father God, right now, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to even speak your name, but ultimately to give. I thank you for good soil. And I declare that if I'm fantasizing and flirting with the idea of a harvest this year, uh, I sow. I declare that I have the heart and the boldness to sow, and sow boldly, sow deep, so with deep roots, knowing that you are a faithful God and that you never leave us to die. You never leave us dry. You never leave us to starve. That when we show you our faith, you show your faithfulness. It's not that you are not a faithful God. It's that through our faith, our eyes are open and we can see where you move. 
And so I thank you and I declare over this legacy offering, I declare that you are going to give and you are going to give boldly through us, through, through, through our hearts and our minds and our spirit. You're going to give us numbers that might even scare us, but you are going to push us beyond our limits to put our faith in you. And I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to thank you guys for this morning. And I just declare blessings and favor over you, especially as we go into this next year. And I expect to see you guys tonight. Thank you.